All right, well, good evening. Woodman family, it's great to be with you guys. My name is Tim, and I work on staff here at Woodman. And if this is your first time with us, or if you're a guest this evening, a warm welcome to you. Genuinely glad that you're here with us. And just know that we would love the opportunity to get to know you more. And if you would like the opportunity to get to know Woodman a little bit more, let me put two potential next steps in front of you. So first, after the service, you can head to Connect Central. It's just out these center doors. If you hang a left, you'll run into a team of people there. I'll be there. We'd love to shake your hand, give you a gift, and then answer any questions you might have about connecting here at Woodman or just what life is like here Uh, at Woodman Valley Chapel. And the second potential next step is Woodman Welcome. So Woodman Welcome takes place on the second Sunday of every single month, so that's tomorrow, downstairs during the 11 a.m. service in the multi-purpose room. It's just adjacent to the coffee shop. Pastor Matt Farrell will be there and he leads that time. In a nutshell, uh, the Woodman Welcome is kind of a 30,000 foot flyover where Matt just walks us through uh, who we are as a church, what we believe and who we partner with, things like that. And so if that would interest you, just know that we would love to see you there tomorrow morning. Well, I just wanna begin this time tonight by celebrating what God has done through the Backpack Bash this summer. So Woodman Valley, we partnered with dozens of churches all across Colorado Springs, and together we supplied backpacks and school supplies for over 11,000 students this upcoming ministry year. And so if you are one of those individuals who helped supply, again, a backpack or school supplies, I just want to say thank you because you are making a big difference in a student's life this upcoming school year. Well, as the school year begins, uh, we have a lot of ministries that are starting up again here at church. And so we have things like community groups, Discipleship Institute, and Woodman U. And so if you're wanting to deepen your faith, maybe connect with other people, or maybe you want to learn just a little bit more about your faith or about the Bible, you can jump into one of those avenues. And again, if you have questions about community groups, Discipleship Institute, or Woodman U, you can stop by Connect Central on your way out this evening, or you can find out more information on the weekend service guide. And you can find the weekend service guide by that QR code that's in front of you right now or through the Woodman app. Well, with that, brothers and sisters, I want to invite you to stand as we continue in our service. Let us sing together. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations, so why would he fail now? He won't, he won't. Oh, I've still got joy in chaos, I've got peace that makes no sense.
Been gone for a few weeks, and it is good to be back and to be able to worship with you and sing out our praises to our Savior, sing of His faithfulness and for, of His goodness. And in this second week of the One Another series, we wanted to introduce a new song to you guys. It comes straight from. It's inspired uh, by the um, by the Book of John, chapter 15. I think you know this. I'm going to read it out for us. It's chapter 15, verses four and five it says this this is jesus words to both me and to you um, so hear the word of the lord abide in me and i in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine neither can you unless you abide in me for i am the vine you are the branches whoever abides in me and i in him he it is that bears much fruit for apart from me you can do nothing. Now, I don't think Jesus is saying we can't function because in my own life, sad to say there have been plenty of days that I have not acknowledged Christ as I should have. I've gotten the work done that I needed to do. I've loved my family. You know, I've been nice to people at the store. But when he says he wants us to abide in his love and be present with him, he wants to give us a freedom and a peace beyond our understanding. And he wants us to have a life that he planned for us, one with lasting impact. He wants me to be the husband and the father that he created me to be. And so as we sing the song, I don't know what you're going through, I don't know what your story is, but as we sing these verses, they're gonna be an acknowledgement of every moment that he's with us throughout every day. And in the choruses, we're gonna sing of who he is, of his goodness, and it's gonna be a request, Lord, teach us. We want to abide in you. We wanna rest in you. So teach us how to do that. So if you know it, please sing out, sing loud. If it's new to you, let us sing over you, be encouraged and join with us as you feel comfortable. But let's continue to worship. I'm the brain. 
when I pass through death, as I enter rest, I depend on you. I depend on you for eternity.
behold him and every tear and we sit here and worship today you who is enthroned above all you who is king over everything and we are so honored to be able to sit at your feet and pour out our praises and give you our burdens because you ask us to give them to you God because you sent your son to die for us to take all those burdens so that we would not have to bear them so, Father, we lay it all down, and we trust you. We trust in the name of Jesus that he will provide again and again and again. And today, we just want to give our offerings to you, not only in worship, but God, but in faithful tithing and giving, that we know you will do amazing things through it, God, and you will bless it. So we ask today that you would bless this offering. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. If this is uh, your first time with us, and whether you're joining online or maybe in person at one of our campuses, uh, my name's Josh. I'm one of the pastors here, and I want to thank you uh, for taking some time uh, to spend it with us. Uh, we are in week two of a new series entitled uh, One Another, and we're looking at the New Testament letter of 1 John. And last weekend, uh, we tried to set up a little bit uh, as to really what John is getting after. And, and broadly speaking, kind of, kind of three things. He wants his listeners uh, to believe the right things. He wants his listeners to live the right way. And he wants them to love one another as they're doing it. And today, we're going to see that one of those three 
is really not like the other two. Uh, just like in math, which, by God's grace, I don't need much in my line of work. But as I recall, uh, if you multiply anything by zero, it's, it's zero. And, and so, too, if love for other people is missing from your life, you're left with nothing. It, 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 it reduces everything to a big, fat zero. It cancels everything out. Regardless of what you may claim to believe, regardless of the things you might point to that you've been trying to do, if there's no love for other people, you got nothing. And that may sound harsh, <laughs> or, or at best, maybe just overly dramatic, but I kind of think in practice, and given some time and maybe the Holy Spirit, we may all concede that it does make some sense. I mean, imagine a guy dating a, a, single, a single mom. And, and ladies, just whatever you think that ideal man would be, feel free to have him in mind. Okay? Guy's awesome. Except, except for one thing. Like he's told her, I think, I think you're so great, baby. I, I, I see this relationship going forward. Something on my heart, though. I, I don't like your kids. <laughs> like at all. How, how do you think that relate? Where do you see the relationship going? Not, it's, it's really kind of losing altitude quick, isn't it? Now, what if he said to her, though, Oh, oh, oh hey, hey. I love your children. I mean, I just don't want to be around them ever. <laughs> Does that help? So why is it? And this is a legitimate question. Why do some professing followers of Jesus think that our Heavenly Father does not care how we treat or speak of his kids? Why do we think that we can act unloving? Why do we think we're at liberty to say whatever we want about them? There is children. That he gave his son life, his son's life, to save. I'll tell you, God cares a lot about his kids. And, and he has a lot of energy when they're mistreated. Especially, I think, if it's one of their brothers or sisters causing the problem. Now, when John wrote this letter, he was really and truly the last of his kind. And, and it must have just been wild. He, he was the last surviving disciple. The last of the 12 that had done life with Jesus. He, he wasn't sharing stories, you know, from Jesus' life. He, he, was, he was sharing from his life when he was with Jesus. And, and he had been forced to, to leave his country. He left Israel. He took Tradition says he followed Jesus' words on the cross pretty serious, took Jesus' mom Mary with him, moves to Ephesus, and, and, and pours his heart into ministry and into a church, a church that was being torn apart. Not by anything outside the church, but being torn apart by those who were in it. And consequently, maybe it's just kind of getting a little older and you know how sometimes old guys just don't care what people think. 
Uh, he, he just doesn't seem to be in the mood to put up with a lot of fluffy talk or excuses. He says things in, in a very black or white, very stark, very direct, and all true, forthright manner. And it's blunt. Now, the advantage, if you will, that John's listeners had over us is that they all knew that there's a strong chance they're going to bump into John. You know what I mean? Like, this isn't like some distant letter. This isn't some article they're reading from like over. Like, this, this is John writing to them with some energy, and, and they might see him at Safeway. And, and he, he could ask questions. He might follow. He well, what did you think? And, and so they couldn't just nod off. Now, us, on the other hand, well, we can easily let his words pass us by. John's not checking up. Now, we can tell ourselves all sorts of things. Doesn't apply to us. And you add to it, and, and we're going to get into it. There are some stuff in, in the, the text today that we're just not 100% sure on. And, and I, I don't mind like saying, hey, unsure exactly what he's getting at here. Here's some of the options. And if that's like, oh, is that kind of embarrassing because you guys should know everything? Not at all. I don't mind telling you when we come to parts that have some discussion about it. If for no other reason, then you have the confidence when we say, no, this is actually just straight up legit we know. And that happens far more often. But you start hearing John talk about love, 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 and then you have some head scratching things. It's easy to be like, well, this is probably for someone, and then to walk out. But maybe in your imagination, imagine John's going to follow up. Imagine John knows you. He's in the cubicle next to yours every Monday through Friday. And, and, and Monday at lunch, he wants to say, so what did you, uh, what'd you think of that bit? I, I want us to be able to answer that, which means we're going to have to wade into some stuff. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you um, for... Your word, I thank you that it tells us all that we need to know. And Father, even for the things that there can be debate or question on, Father, we are never left with losing out. Your word is, what we say, sufficient. And so God, I pray that you would allow it to take root in our heart. Give us, give us a willing spirit. Maybe to ask ourselves tough questions if need be. Help me not to mess it up. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you would turn to 1 John chapter 2, we're in verse 7. And uh, last weekend, we concluded with verse 6. And that reads, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Uh, say it another way, if we claim to follow Jesus, we should do the same things he did. And, and that's what John's going to flesh out next. Uh, this is the call on every believer. So if you're a follower of Christ, you've confessed him as Lord, you could just write in them, this is for me, and, and draw like an arrow. Verse 7, beloved, I am writing you no new commandment but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. Uh, the old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it's, it's a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Now to start, notice how he begins, right? He refers to them as his beloved. Now, depending on the translation you're using, it may not say that. I'm looking at the ESV, the English Standard Version. They translate it beloved. Other versions, the NIV translate it, uh, translates it my friends. Um, 
dear friends rather, another one is my dear people. And the rationale seems to be in some of those translations is there's just something about beloved today that doesn't, you know, flow off the tongue. Have you ever gone to the wedding? Dearly beloved, we're gathered here. And you're like, I don't know you. Why are you calling me your beloved? Right? It just sounds a little, it sounds a little archaic. And, and so translations are like, well, let's say dear friends. And it gets at the heart of what John is getting after. And admittedly, it does sound a little old school. And dear friends is more, is more relatable. But I wonder if at this point, John would actually have, like, take some umbrage to it. In a different way than you and I might. You know, almost like if he heard it read out like dear friends. He'd be like, what do you mean dear friends? I don't even know those people. See, because for us generally, we talk about having a relationship with someone. We're friends with someone. And it, and it can grow into love as we get to know them and feelings develop and such and such a thing. John looks at it the opposite. No, I can love them. They're created in God's image. These are brothers and sisters in Christ. I love I don't even know them. Don't even know them yet. Might know them. We have friends that lead to love. John had love that could lead to friendship. He intentionally writes and says, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. And he, he starts off here by wanting to set the record straight. And if you weren't here last week, you can go back and read it. John started just throwing a lot of stuff at him. And, and he wants to just clear up, like, just so you know, guys, this is nothing new. I, I, I've not gone off script, so to speak. You, you know this. This is no new commandment. It's the one that you heard about in the beginning. And where it gets a little heady, and, and maybe a whiteboard would help, but if I wrote on it, you wouldn't be able to read it, is that Jesus uses the same words to talk about the same subject in a different way than John is here. And, and so, if you think of this podium, pulpit, it, it, this, let's say this is where John's listeners live. This is their time, right? So back in the day, in the Old Testament, Leviticus 19, Deuteronomy 6, God was very upfront, love me, love others. Right? Like, like from the get-go, God was all about that. That was the commandment. Love God, love others. And then you move kind of forward in time, and Jesus pops onto the scene. And then John 13, he tells everybody, hey, 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 I got a, I got a new commandment for you. Everybody leans in. Love others. The way that I love you. So, wait, 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 so they were always supposed. What's 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 the new part? Well, it, it, it's it's really in the quality of the love is what makes it new. So, if you grew up in a home that was like pet friendly, but all you ever had was like cats, <laughs> and and then you turn thirteen. And you get a puppy. <laughs> this is like way better. It likes me. I like it. It does things. Like it's just. Now if you press the analogy too much, it loses everything. But I just wanted to slam cats, really. <laughs> but, but Jesus, you, you, you know that you're supposed to love other people. Everyone, that's been like, that's from the start. What's new is. I want you now to love others like I've loved you. Which was about to be demonstrated most powerfully in him who was without sin, dying on behalf of those who had it. So, the new is in how. The new is in the quality. And then we get to John's listener's day. By this point, that new commandment that Jesus gave 
That's the old commandment. Every one of those listeners that came to faith in Jesus, they started with the new. They started with the new. That's all they've known. We run into that. A telephone used to be attached to things fixed with cords. What? That some people just don't even have a, like a, what are you talking about? That all they knew was the new commandment. Does that make sense? Good, because John's going to confuse it. Verse 8. At the same time, at the same time, it's a new commandment. What? At the same time, it's a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So I'm not writing you a new commandment. It's an old commandment, but at the same time, it's a new commandment. What's he getting at? Well, I can use a real-life example from the Lindstrom home. Recently, a couple weeks ago, the director of household operations said that no longer were dishes to stop and rest in the sink before going into the dishwasher. Apparently, they can go straight in. (laughs) So now... That, that's been the case. It's, it's an old commandment. Just put the dishes in the dishwasher. That's what she says. But today, as I have my little bowl and my spoon, walk into the sink, it was a new commandment. It didn't matter how many times I'd done it before. It didn't matter if I had, like, perfect straight to dishwasher record, right there at that moment, I had a decision. Am I going to listen to the command or not? I think it's a really good example. (laughs) What John is saying, what John is saying is, you know, guys, I'm I'm not telling you something new. I don't want you thinking like I've gone off the program here. This is... This is like the old commandment. You've known this from the start. We are to love others like Jesus loves us. But I'm telling you, it's going to feel, it's going to feel like a new commandment. He says it's true in him, in Jesus, and in you. So as the listeners are hearing this in real time, John's saying, this is true about Jesus. He loves others the way that he loves them. And we are to love others the way that he did. Very true, very now, very present. But you know what? Tomorrow, the future, every one of John's listeners is going to have to answer the question, am I going Am I going to obey? He's saying the commandment is true in Jesus, and it's the same commandment that's in us, but tomorrow it will become new again. Why? Or how, I guess. Because the darkness, because this world is passing away, and the true light is already shining. You know, people going to say people often say, but that might not be true. But, but a lot of times, people, people say history repeats itself. You heard that? You ever said that? I, I, know, I, know what, I know what they mean when they say it. But biblically speaking, it doesn't. History is passing away. And we are marching on towards the fulfillment of what Jesus promised. And and each and every day, we are closer than we were the day before. And, And we're not repeating stuff. We are just on one steady, eddy course to the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and, and it, it's, it's like a car. You're, you're, you're headed north on I-25, and a car's going south. Like, you, you can see it, 
but, but like it's gone. It's gone. It gets in the rear view. It's gone, right? You are still moving forward. And that's what we are with the darkness of this world. The darkness is going away, and we who are in Christ, we are that light. Jesus is the light of the world, and through us, his light shines. And it may feel like the darkness is overwhelming. It may feel like the darkness is growing, but Jesus is like it passing away. The light has come. We can sometimes, and maybe your grandparents said this, maybe you're the grandparent that says it. Look back the good old days. You know, when you could leave your car unlocked, when you could paint with lead paint. If only we could go back. I think some people do want to go back. Biblically, I think it's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I want Jesus. I don't need to add any more time to my clock. I don't need to go back in time and give myself more time to wait for his return. We are on schedule. Nothing. It's taken him by surprise. We are moving forward. The call for each of us is to love one another as he has loved us. Are you loving others like Jesus loved you? You say, why are you throwing this new stuff at us? It's actually not a new commandment. It's an old one. But in a way, it's a new commandment today, too. Are you heeding it? Here's the caution we must consider. Verse 9. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother or sister is still in darkness. Now, saying whoever at the beginning is important because John is writing to the people who stayed in the church, didn't leave. He's not accusing, he's not saying that they've done this. He's now like kind of making up and he's trying to teach them. He's not pointing the finger at them. But he's saying whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother, he's still in darkness. And this is the caution or, or the warning. If you say you're in the light, you're living in great relationship with Jesus, but at the same time you're hating a brother or sister... You're actually not in the light like you think you are. You, you, you are remaining in darkness. And if you were with us last week for those first four verses, and it just seemed like John was like, ah, you know, like crazy stuff, as loose as he was with his language there, he's really specific about what he says here. Did you notice it? He does not say, whoever is in the light and hates his brother... What do you say? Whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother. And why doesn't, why doesn't John say whoever is in the light and hates his brother? Be- because it's impossible. He can't. It's like hot ice. It does, you, you do not have, you're not living in the light while you hate your brother. You cannot. You cannot do it. You can hate mushrooms, and you should, but you cannot hate a brother or sister. You say it all you want. You're not there. You say, well, how, how, how do I know if I'm hating my brother or sister? I think, John, I, I think John gives us a little test in verse 10. Whoever loves his brother or sister abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. Now, I said, I think he gives us a test because there is some question as to what John means here. And again, if you're looking at the New International Version, it translates it, anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. And what the question is with commentators and translators is who is it that John thinks is stumbling? Who's who's the one tripping up? Is it like me? Or, or is it my brother or sister? And the NIV thinks it's me. That if I live in the light, loving brothers and sisters, I will not trip. 
And, and maybe get to heaven can ask John, hey, on that thing that you said about the thing, but I think the way that the ESV translates it here, it's saying that if I love my brother and sister, if I'm living in the light, if I'm loving and if I'm in the light, I'm not going to cause them to stumble. Which to me makes a lot more sense. Because I can be very loving to other people and still trip myself up. And in the context of talking about love for brothers and sisters, it would seem that that's what John is saying. If you're living in the light, if you're loving brothers and sisters, you will not be causing them to stumble. And then he offers this grim reality. He says, whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. If you hate a brother or sister, John's like, you are in the dark. You do not know where you're going. You cannot see your way. Which means if you have that opportunity to, to travel to Zambia and you want to see Victoria Falls and you're all excited and you got your phone and you're walking and it dawns on you, there's, there's no fences. There's no fences. There's an edge and 354 feet. And let's say you're so excited and you're on the clock. The bus is leaving. And you want to snap some pics. And you get there and you're right about to. And then it's like God ordained a mist comes in. You can't see anything. What do you do? You should sit down. Right? Right? You, like I don't know where I am. And I know there's an edge and there's 354 feet. I'm just going to wait. And if the bus leaves, it leaves. It's not the time for me to start groping around. I'm not going to try to make. I'm just going to sit tight. And so John would tell you, if you have hate in your heart for someone, it's the time to stop, drop, and no rolling, just stay where you are. No posting on social media, no sharing your feelings about how you think they're doing. Ask the Lord to soften your heart so that you can see clearly. Do you hate a brother or sister? Most of us would say no. But the test is, do you in any way cause them to stumble? And if so, you may not think that you hate them. But John would say you're not loving them. And as far as John's concerned, there's only two options. And this runs very counter to the way a lot of us think in the West. I'm not responsible. I'm responsible for myself. And if you're a follower of Christ, you're responsible for others too. Now, depending on what the individual has done to you, it may... It may be more or less difficult to get to the point where you could say, I'm going to release them. I'm going to, I'm going to say no to the hate, and I'm going to love them the best I can. And loving doesn't mean entering back into relationships that are bad. Loving doesn't mean that there's no boundaries. It, it, it means I, I, I'm, I'm going to want the best for them. I'm going to love them the way Jesus loved me. It's a real caution, and we need to consider it. You'd hate to say that you're living in the light. You'd hate to think that you are, only to find out later that you weren't. These are the convictions we need to cling to. Look at verse 12. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. We're going to fly through this because there are so many variables. It would take forever to unpack them. 
That being said, John's purpose is sort of like, who remembers Hans and Franz from Saturday Night Live? We are here to what? Pump you up. That's what John wants to do. John's been laying down some heavy stuff, and he's like, time for a break. I need to pump him up a little. And even the way it's laid out in your word right now, you can see it's kind of like done as poetry. But there's several issues. First three, he says, I'm writing, and then he says, I write. He changes tenses, and it's like probably just sort of stylistic to help us memorize it. But then you got this children, fathers, young men thing. And some think it stages spiritual growth, like, you know, children in the faith, young men in the faith, fathers in the faith. Others think that it's actually, you know, John's addressing literal. He's talking about literal age, like, like children, young men, and fathers. But it's just weird, the order, if it's literal age, you don't usually go from children to fathers to young men. Others, and I'm probably in this category, though I'm not going to arm you, wrestle you for it, is that throughout, and you'll see it, John addresses these guys as his little children, his children, the beloved. I, I think he's saying children, and he's talking about the whole church, and then he addresses the mature in their faith, the fathers, and gives them a little shot in the arm, and then he talks about young men, those who are young in their faith, to give them a little shot in the arm. And so that would seem consistent to me. It seems like it could work. So what would this mean then? Well, the other issue is the word that's translated because could just as easily be translated that. But in a nutshell, the world, according to Pastor Josh, is he's saying children, and he's addressing the whole church. Men, women, all of them. And he's reminding them that your sins are forgiven, and you know the Father. I wonder if that's just the one takeaway any of us need to go home with. They they could have been struggling. People have left the church. Maybe they've not been loving. And John's saying this. John's saying whoever. And they're like, he's saying whoever, but he's talking about me. He's talking about me. And John wants to be like, hey, hey, slow down. You know the Father. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you those sins. And then he goes to the fathers, the spiritually mature And he tells them the same thing twice. You know him who is from the beginning. Maybe those guys mature in the faith are losing hope. You know, it's funny that I think younger people in the faith think, oh, when I get to be mature in the faith, then things will be easier. I find it worse. I find I'm more aware of my sin than I used to be. I now have more data points of bad things in the world. I have more data points of people who have failed. I have more data points of prayers that have been prayed and no answers have come. And John would say to me, you know him who's from the beginning, right? The sovereign God of the universe who holds everything in his hands. You're good. And then to the young in the faith, men and women, who have these things that they're finding out, coming at them fast. What, I can't do that? I do that all the time. And they're thinking, I, I'm, I'm just so bad at this. And he's like, whoa, you have overcome the evil one. Do you know that? The spirit that raised Christ from the dead, it dwells in you. Do you know that God's word, the spirit of God, dwells in you? Rest easy. In this section, John is like the father who's taking his kids on a hike, but it's all uphill. You know, and they've just been trudging along. And then finally, dad's like, you know what? Up here, sit down. Take, Take a break. And it's twofold. Let's reflect on how far we've come. But deep breath, we still got a ways to go. And that's what's interesting about this little break here is because in a real way, it's a shot in the arm for what he's just been throwing down. But in another way, it looks ahead to what he's going to say next. Do you need to remember these things? Have you been finding it hard? Do you need to remind yourself that in Christ your sins are forgiven and as a result you know the Father? 
Are you older in the faith but find that maybe you're struggling more than you did at the beginning? Do you need to remember that you know the one who's from the beginning? The one who holds the entire universe in his hands has got you. You have relationship with him. He's in control. You and I may be sweating, but he is not. Or do you need to remember that through Christ you have actually overcome that there's nothing that's going to separate you from his love, that there's nothing that's going to befall you that will take your salvation away. You're going to be okay. Fact is, though, this is only a shot in the arm if you've confessed Christ as Lord. John is convinced He's writing to those that stayed. He believes these are his spiritual kids and he has every confidence they know Christ. It brings me no joy to say, but I can't, looking across this room, let alone all the others, say that that's true of everyone who's listening to me now. We need to confess Christ as Lord, believe that God raised him from the dead. He gives us new life. He gives us eternal life. But the expectation is it changes us. It doesn't just change our relationship with him vertically. It should change our relationship with those who are in our lives horizontally. And it should change the very fabric of our relationship to the world in which we are in. This is the command for us to follow. Verse 15, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Commentators sort of wrestle about it a little bit because in one way it doesn't directly follow what has come before it. But in another, I I think... I could see how we got there, you know, like he's talking about the things that we should love. Then he gives a little shot in the arm and then he's like, there's things that we shouldn't love. I should probably tell them what not to love. And then if you want to talk about something that can take away your love for people, well, it's taking your eyes off the prize kind of thing. Much like hating your brother or sister is incompatible with walking in the light, so too will the love of the world reveal that the love of the Father is not in you. And he gives like a 30,000 foot description of it. He talks about the desires of the flesh. Which really is any desire or sinful interest. Like from the inside. Like from the inside out kind of thing. And then he speaks about the the desire of the eyes. And those would be sinful things that are are activated from the outside. It's kind of like you may not be coveting at all inside yourself. But then when your buddy shows you the new 9-11, you're like... Dang! Is that not for everybody? (laughs) And then he talks about the pride of life. And that is pride in property or possessions. All of those things, John says, that's not from the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing away with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. You say, but I thought John knew that God so loved the world that he gave his own son. He's not talking about the people in the world here. He's talking about the sinful system in which this world operates. This system which you and I, if we're honest, can find so appealing from time to time. Right now, we are in the stage of trying to pack our eldest up for college. And and apart from all the feels, there are several considerations. One, it's like all these things that like, he's going to need this and he needs that. And I'm like, you know what? He's got to be part of his own rescue. Just let him go. <laughs> I don't say it that way. But, but the stuff's got to fit in the car to get there. And I don't really know what kind of space he's going to have once he arrives. So it makes you kind of pare down and think about what's important, you know. I think that's what John's trying to get us to focus on here. The stuff of this world is going to kill us. And there are people around us who, if they die, they spend eternity separated from God. 
And people matter more to him than possessions. And if he and I are driving out to the school, car packed with the Gilla stuff, and then we see people who are stranded on the side of the road somewhere, and we're like, well, we had all our stuff. What were we going to do? You would think, I'm a jerk. Leave the stuff and help the people. Here's the fact. This love thing that John's getting after, it's not sitting with you. You're not going to like the rest of the book. It's not going away. This is the call on every believer. We must love our brothers and sisters. And the caution that we must consider is we may not be as loving as we think. As far as John's concerned, it's either or. There is no middle. And the convictions we need to cling to is that Jesus did everything he did for us before we ever did anything for him. While we were yet still sinners, he died for us. And the command for us to follow, this world is literally killing us. What do we need to let go of? Amen? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven. God, I just pray. I thank you, actually, that in much the same way John could write and speak in this sort of imaginary illustration, whoever says to try to teach his flock, so too, I'm not aware. Honestly, I'm not aware of a, like a, people in our church hating other people in our church. Like, and maybe it's happening. I imagine it's happening, but I personally don't know of it. And so I feel a confidence to say, hey, we got to keep the, the love thing up and the hate thing can't be a part of it. But God, in our church's life and in my own life, I don't want to do what I said we needed to avoid from the start. I don't want to just gloss past me. I don't want to say I'm doing great when I might not be. And so, Father, allow us to sit. Allow us to rest. Allow us to ask the question, am I abiding in you the way I say that I am? Help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're able, would you stand with us as we respond in worship? is coming and your kingdom is here alive in our waiting and at work in our tears so come to us quickly forever a prayer your kingdom is coming Lord Jesus come
to see, I want to see people the way Jesus does. And as, as we were singing, as I was listening, couldn't help but think that, that how simple that may sound, but how honestly I know for me how difficult that can be. To my shame, how wrapped up I can get with my stuff, but to notice and to reach out. So I'm wondering this evening, as we leave, who is it that you can be thinking of, that the Lord is, is calling you to pursue, to love, to notice, to sit down over a cup of coffee, over a lunch, a neighbor, a coworker. It could be someone that you see every single Saturday night, two rows in front of you, and yet you maybe have forgotten their name. Just giving everyone permission. If someone asks you your name, don't be mad. Just reach out. Pursue them. Who is it that we need to reach after? Because when we are grafted in to the family of God, yes, our relationship with him changes. But as we heard, it should change our relationship with others. So let's pursue people. And if we can help you in any way, if we can come and pray with you, whether you're here in person, whether you're joining us online, if we can pray for you in any way, let us know after the service, they're gonna have, we're gonna have pastors and leaders up front. It would be our honor to pray with you. But as you go, go with these words, receive this blessing. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory, with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen and amen. Go in his grace and go in his peace.